welcome to this opening space series, the series of interviews uh, in which we are sharing our passion for open space technology all around the world. And today I have the immense pleasure to have with me uh, Matilda Leiser, she is Associate Director with Improbable Theatre. She is an artist, a mother of two, a writer. And thank you so much, Matilda, for being here. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> I should maybe introduce myself for the people who watch this for the first time. My name is Annick Corriveau. I'm an open space technology facilitator based in Quebec. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. We will talk about children today. Um, Matilda, I'm truly amazed every time I participate in um, an open space, a virtual open space event by um, Improbable Theatre in London. There are children and they are not only watching the whole bunch of adults being there. They are calling for sessions and they are facilitating sessions with groups of adults. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but just before we start talking about children, would you tell us a little bit about how, what is open space technology for you and how you discovered it? Okay, um, so I'm, I'm going to do that in the reverse order that you asked me. So how I discovered it was through uh, Phelan McDermott, who is now my husband, but wasn't at the time that I discovered Open Space. Um, and he, he has been running Open Space um, sessions for the theatre and performing arts community in the UK for 16 years now under the title of devoted and disgruntled which was the um the the name he gave to the first invitation that he ever sent out to that community in the uk um and he just read harrison owen's book and recognized it because the practice that phelim follows and that i also engage in is um one rooted in improvisation and he recognized it as essentially harrison's description of open space as a kind of set of instructions for one great big improvisation. Um, and that therefore really excited him. Um, and likewise, I, um, I felt a kind of innate and um, deep connection to the principles and the law um, of mobility or the law of two feet um, as really, um, helping uh, people to connect to their sense of agency and uh, move from there, which is something that is, is true to all the work that I do um, in, in my in rehearsal rooms or when I'm writing. Um, so I felt a, a kind of deep connection on, on a creative practice level to the practice of open space. Mm, awesome. So, so we could look at open space events as great and big improvisations absolutely and yeah and um, how do you do it with the children because they're such leaders in improbable events um your your little daughter uh, i think the first time i met her she was five years old and she facilitated with you um a conversation on um, how do you bring beauty into this world? And I was so fascinated, so amazed. And that was an awesome conversation. How do you do it? Um, so I really, um, well, there's different ways to answer that question. Um, one is to say that um, I believe that the children really are our teachers because the children Absolutely. I mean, I don't just mean my children. I think all children, they completely understand it, the principles and um, law of mobility that I was referencing in open space anyway. I mean, the, the idea that you should have to tell a child 
to follow themselves is absurd. That's what children do. You know, they follow their passion. They follow their interests. They don't need to be told to do that. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's, um, it's more the other way around. It's not, oh, how on earth do children that like the problem is the adults, you know, <laughs> they're the ones that need reminding. Um, uh, uh, and so really, I feel that the, the structure of open space really supports me as a parent and an adult to, um, to support my children to follow themselves, which is, which is what they, it, it enables that, you know, really supports that, which is a, a process that wants, they want to do anyway. Um, uh, I also should name that I, I guess I've made that part, that whole kind of um, ongoing research in a way between um, creative practice and mothering uh, is part of my my work, I run a, I founded and helped run uh, an initiative called Mothers Who Make, which is um, uh, supports people who hold caring roles to also sustain their creative identities, and to it kind of questions the still very strong cultural assumption that holding a caring role necessarily has to undermine or be kind of in conflict with. Um, a creative practice so uh, uh, and one of the things that I the reasons that I started that movement is that when I became a mother I noticed that the um, different environments were very segregated either they were child-centered environments like a playground where the children were in the middle and the adults were literally on the outside and adult needs and concerns were on the outside uh, or they were adult-centered spaces where the children were mostly just not there and not welcomed. So those were kind of rehearsals in my case or meetings. You might hear children in the background now, by the way, they may, <laughs> um, they're just downstairs with their dad. Um, uh, and I, what I felt was missing was a more integrated space. So one that was adult centered, but where the children were welcomed and integrated. So mothers who make all our, meetings and events model that that and that there still seems like a very radical space to have something that is um, adult centered but where the children are integrated and their needs respected and welcomed and where the adults who are there in a caring role can be present in all their roles so they can be present as a carer but also present as a creative or in what other so-called professional roles they might hold and um that kind of space is so much more possible than many people think it is. Um, you know, people have an idea that, that children are a problem very often in, in sort of workspaces and that they need to be separated and sort of taken care of separately and that we need to organise child care rather than the idea that actually it's just people care. And we kind of, all, you know, we, we share similar needs, whatever age we are. Um, and I think open space is really fantastic at creating a, a, a culture and environment where that is really recognized and where anybody of every of any age is supported to follow themselves. Mm. Um, and that yeah. And when we organize an open space events, uh, knowing that there will be children there, um, are there ways to prepare adults? To that it seems um, it seems that uh, adults must uh, have to be more prepared uh, beforehand than the children uh, yeah I um, I think it's you know really it's the same I don't think you have to do anything extra I think what you have to do is do the same things that you do for any open space process, but really, really commit to them and do them really deeply and with huge integrity. So what I mean by that is um, like the first, in my understanding, the very first um, step in opening space happens before people arrive, happens in, at the point of invitation. Um, and 
a, a true invitation is one where which is really is is genuinely open you know it's invitational and it doesn't exclude people so it uh i think if you really if you're really inviting kind of the whole person and a whole community or then that can include people of different ages and um often people because it's kind of radical people need reminding adults need reminding that that's possible you know we have to put on our invitations you know people of all ages are welcome children are welcome you don't need to leave them behind we have to sort of really flag that very loudly because that the assumption is that you you can't integrate them Mm -hmm. um so i i think the main preparation is is um in Inviting and opening, opening people's minds, hearts, uh, opening people's sense of possibility even before you get into the room. Hmm. And at home with your children, uh, do you often use the the open space principles? Um, we don't explicitly use them. We did both. Uh, we had them on the wall during both of my labours when I was giving birth (laughs) they're very helpful in that instance and very applicable um uh you know whoever comes are the right people whenever it starts is the right time when it's over it's over when it's not over it's not over my son took five days to be born (laughs) it wasn't over for a long time (laughs) but um uh so in that sense principles uh are definitely fundamental to have to to their lives um I think it informs our understanding of how we parent. Um, We, our, um, we're more fluid than I think many other kind of home structures might be. Um, I would not in any way hold us up as some kind of ideal. Our homes, it, um, both our children. My son is autistic, and my my daughter maybe. We are, um, so they're very high maintenance. <laughs> our lives are quite chaotic, also because of what we uh, do. But um, I think, um, I think really that 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 law of mobility that it that is a is a kind of value that both me and my husband live by that it is fundamentally a kind of vital practice to connect to oneself and follow one's passion and that that is something that we want for our children as well Hmm. Um, before we leave uh, would you like to tell us a little bit more about mothers who make there might be creatives all around the world who would like Mm. to join this group is it possible for people outside of England to join mothers who make absolutely so it's an to my delight it I didn't intend to start an international movement but that's what it's become Um, and we have uh, groups or hubs we call them in Australia America and France I think so far and obviously numerous ones across the UK. Um, It really, it's a, it's a movement, um, as I said, to support anyone who identifies as um, female or non-binary and uh, who holds or wants to maybe hold a caring role. So you don't actually have to have children. We have um, people who are thinking about maybe having children or bereaved mothers also um, with no living child um, participate anyone who identifies Mm -hmm. with the challenge and um, and joy of holding a caring role and a creative role Um, and we our core practice is a peer support one Um, thanks to the pandemic really we hold a lot of our meetings online now so we have a, a monthly international peer support um group and um as well as there being these regional meetings that happen um in particular places um and the principles of open space really inform 
um, the way in which we meet. So it's a, the, the spaces are always non-hierarchical and um, people are supported to, again, kind of listen to themselves and to each other. Um, but it's a very, very uh, welcoming environment. I know people often kind of self-exclude and go, oh, I'm not really a maker, I'm not really a creative, but um, there is, you don't have to show your CV at the door. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> there is no um and we're open to all kinds of creative practices you know um you, you if you're making cake or if you're making a book or if you're making a painting um you're equally welcome mm, yeah. and uh, what is the website address yeah thank you it's www.mothershomake.org and we'll put it also under the video on youtube yeah Thank you so much, Mathilde, for being with us today and sharing your experience and sharing about Mothers Who Make. Thank you. Thank you. And I welcome everybody who, is, who are watching this um, to go look at Improbable Theatre, your um, online events and if you have the chance to be in England uh, I, I would love to participate in, a, in an event in presence also uh, you guys do amazing work uh, in open space technology and um, I'm very very happy you took this time with us thank you Matilda thank you so much for having me thank you So thank you for watching this interview and uh, I hope we'll have the chance to see you um, very soon. Bye.